There can be no whitewash at the White House. Isn't it good to know? I don't think that there will be a woman prime minister uh, in my lifetime. There are some things. We have built a balloon that works. We think we're quite close now. Some people. These allegations are false. And some times in life you can depend on. The 9 o'clock news on BBC One. Renowned for their nerves. I tell you, after five years, it really gets here. <laughs> Looks like it. And calm disposition. You're just winding me up here, aren't you? <laughs> this Monday. Do you want to play that again? <laughs> this Monday. Watch the managers crack under pressure. That's a dodgy quick. We want to see it. It's been a set up from start to finish. Back after its mid-season break, a question of sport. Tomorrow at 7 on BBC One. Hunter, scavenger and killer, but still one of the most admired creatures in the world. A wildlife special of the wolf in 45 minutes. First on BBC One, The Antiques Roadshow. of the greatest natural harbours in the world and scene of many historic incidents in Britain's long maritime history. It was from here, for instance, that Sir Francis Drake set out to defeat the Spanish Armada. And these steps in Sutton Harbour mark the spot where the Pilgrim Fathers set sail for their new life in the New World. But one of the lesser known incidents of history took place here in Plymouth Sound in July 1815. A Royal Naval warship, HMS Bellerophon, anchored just out here with a rather important prisoner on board. His name, Napoleon Bonaparte. While in Plymouth, Napoleon became the object of intense curiosity. This painting by Jules Girardet shows how local people rode out to the ship to get their one and only glimpse of the former French emperor, some of them throwing bouquets of flowers to him. Napoleon had written to the Prince Regent, pleading to be allowed to live at peace in England, but the government, under Lord Liverpool, were concerned that he might become the focus of a growing Republican discontent and were determined to get him out of sight and out of mind, thousands of miles away on an island in the South Atlantic. And it was another event in the South Atlantic in 1982 that's part of the history of the Royal Navy. Many of the ships in the Falklands War came from Devonport. The dockyard is the largest in Britain. Between the 17th century and the 1960s, more than 300 warships were built here, and the King William Yard remains as one of the finest groups of buildings in the country. These massive frigate sheds are big enough to accommodate a whole warship and are as tall as Nelson's Column. Although the Royal Navy is not the size it was, the dockyard still provides work for more people than any other employer in the city, and it's soon to be the home of the Trident nuclear submarine fleet. Of special interest to us is a man who was working here in Plymouth in the middle of the 18th century. His name was William Cookworthy. He was a chemist by profession, but his passion was porcelain. And for 20 years, he struggled trying to find the secret of making true or hard paste porcelain. Eventually, in 1768, he succeeded. And these are among his earliest pieces. Porcelain like this, the first to be made in Britain, is as rare now as hen's teeth. This piece, for instance, authenticated on the bottom, William Cookworthy, Factory, Plymouth, 1770. And the collection of Plymouth porcelain here in the city's museum and art gallery is unquestionably one of the finest and most comprehensive anywhere in the world. Our home for the day is the city's Guild Hall, extensively rebuilt after the Blitz, which destroyed so much of old Plymouth. So let's now join our experts with the people of this part of Devon. Well, this is a splendid collection of uh, Fugas books and drawings, and it certainly brought a smile to my face this morning. Um, tell me, where did you get this original cartoon from? I understand from my father that it actually came from an RAF camp, mess war, at the end of the war, 
um, Old Colne in Essex. And uh, I always thought it was a print. I didn't realise it was an original. When did you find it was an original? I think because it was out of its frame when it that's came it, to that's us. That's it. It's impossible looking to at tell. the backing board. Yeah. Yes, it's impossible to tell um, uh, unless you actually get it out of a frame and look at it. But if you look down here and feel there, there's a little bit of scratching out where he's done a bit of work on it. But it's lovely. Now, Fugast, do you know about Fugast? Do you know? Well, I've always known, been aware of him. The I mean, the careless talks, always in the house. Yes. cost yes. lives and all that sort of thing. And he has this very distinctive style. Yes. Um, Fugas was the uh, pen name of somebody called Kenneth Bird, and he was uh, invalided out of the First World War in 1915, um, and he couldn't walk for five years. But in 1916, his first drawing was actually published by Punch, this very distinctive sort of Art Deco style almost. Uh, Fugas it comes from the French. It was a French word which means um, a, 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 an underground bomb. A bomb was put in the ground and packed tightly with stones, and so when it blew, it would give the maximum damage. And I suspect that that's probably what happened to him during the war. And it also means actually a whim or a fancy or something like that, which is rather nice because, you know, these cartoons are his whims and fancies. It's a very well-chosen name. Look at this one, this lovely one, the park keeper calling all out when all the <laughs> railings have been taken for the war effort. And this one too. The, the, the war's humanizing influence, uh, the shelter trench. Um, for the first hour, nobody talks to each other. For the second, they talk individually. And then the third hour, all, they're all talking. And four hours following, they're all fast asleep. It's just lovely. Now, these books that you've got here, um, they're lovely, but they're not in very good condition, I have to say, so they're not going to be of any great uh, commercial value. But this here, this does have a value, this original cartoon. Do you have any idea of its None, value? none whatsoever, no. Well, Fugas is very collectible, and he's going up tremendously in price. And I think now, if that came on the market, you'd have to pay somewhere in the region of £800 for it. Nice, very nice. Well, thank you for bringing it here. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is basically a Sheraton design, but Sheraton was working in the late 18th century. This is clearly later. But what a lovely wood. Do you know what wood it is? I believe it's satin wood. Absolutely. But the quality, look at this graining here. I mean, it's fantastic. Beautifully figured, almost like a flame figure graining. And what is unusual is that this, at first glance, is, I think, until we looked at it, late 19th, early 20th century piece of furniture. And this type of satin wood is, I think, from the West Indies. Normally, by about 1850, 1860, so 50, 60 years before this was made, they were using East Indies, because they ran out, literally. They couldn't get to it in the West Indian, in the Caribbean, in the South, South Americas. And this is obviously, I suspect, being saved for a special job. So it's wonderful graining, and literally, I've only just noticed uh, in the light. Do you know what that material is? Tortoiseshell. Yeah. Fantastic to have tortoiseshell in something like that. So what have we got inside? Let's have a look. That's, oh, I see. Complete. Wow. Complete dressing table. And it's all complete. Well, almost. What have, what have you missing? Just a few pieces. Several bottles and little, little containers. Right, right. But in the sat and what have we got here? It's, it's oh, look at that. Wow. That's in all its glory. And these are, uh, I assume these are all silver, are they? Yes, they are, yes. Do you know what date? I, I wouldn't pretend I've to know the date. I've looked it up and it's 1913. 1913. Well, that fits in with what I'd expect for this type of, just before the First World War. And really, it was over by the First World War. They never made this sort of thing again afterwards, really. It was just too expensive to make. Um, there's a firm called Barrett who are making silver fittings for dressing tables uh -huh. in Burlington Street, Burlington Arcade in the West End. Um, in the Mayfair area, and it may well be them who made the actual um, the silver fittings for this, but it's beautifully, it's just fantastically well made. Would you know who made it? It could be Harrods, it could be Maples, it could be Asprey's, any of the big firms working just before the Great War. It's very surprising it hasn't got a name on it. Yeah. Um, sometimes they did, sometimes they don't. It might, don't. it might have been a special commission, and occasionally special commissions didn't have a name on it. Um, I mean, these are great, these, I mean, look at all this. You've got sliding drawers and everything else like that. Anything else going on in here? I mean, there's, there's also a, a little secret drawer. A secret sure. drawer, thank yeah, switch in here. You're not going to tell us the secret, are you? No. Look away. <laughs> look away, all right. Isn't that wonderful? 
So you press down on that screw? On the screw, yes. So it's funny, it's got a handle, but yet it's a secret drawer. You try. Right. Very frustrating, you never open it, and you no. never find that. So tell me, you haven't had it long, so how long have you had it? We were in, on holiday in France eight weeks ago, saw it in an antique shop and bought it. Just like that? Yes. Hang on, this is an English dressing table. Let's make yes. this clear, it's English. Yes. And you found it in France? Yes. Did you know it was English when you found it? Um, it looked Georgian to me, first of all. Right. And after looking at the silver and other things, I thought it's just wonderful quality and we'll have to have it. So we went to the bank and bought it. That's you talking. Did you agree? Did you want it as well? I was a bit, because of the age of it, because he thought it was later and the, the amount of money we were going to spend, I was a bit doubtful. Me. I oh, thought right. it was a lot of money to spend. Right. But what did the dealer sell it as then? Um, what he didn't he say. It? He was French and he couldn't he speak English. English though. So, and do you speak French? No. So how did you communicate? Um, I tried minus 10% discount and he wouldn't have any of that. What, in sign language or something? Yes. I wrote 10%, minus 10%, right. but no. He, we worked out the price and... Right, right. So you bought it recently. Gosh, that's going to give me a challenge, isn't it? Yeah. You bought it recently. Well, I'm going to have to ask you. I thought of a figure, so you're going to have to be honest. What did you pay? And let's see where we are. This is a bit tense when it's only just been bought. 2,500. 2,500 pounds? Yes. What, about 25,000 francs, roughly, or yes. whatever? Yes, right. Yes. Well, I was happy with the deal. I'm not surprised you were happy with the deal. I mean, these make a lot of money. Certainly a piece like this at auction today, at auctions, I'm not talking about a retail price, has got to be at least 10 to 12,000 pounds. Or should we say 100 to 120,000 French francs? Good, yeah. It's a splendid Devon pig because although these are Weems ware, uh, these two were actually made at Bervy Tracy uh, after 1915. A little bit of damage on them, but uh, that's not a problem. Carl Nicola started the, uh, the factory in 1853 for Robert Heron and Son at Cacaldi in Fife. Where I used to work for them, oh, by coincidence. Yeah. Ah, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. But you didn't buy them up there? No, no. My father bought them about 40 years ago, somewhere near Dorchester. And what did he pay? I believe about £60 pounds in the money of the time. All right. Yeah. One of the factory workers, Plichter, came down to Devon and started to work at Bubby Tracy, producing these things under licence from the family. Right. Uh, they were called Weems after Weems Castle, the Grover yeah. family, and they were made very popular as nursery wear. Oh, right. Um, Queen Mother must have had these in her nursery right. because she collects avidly. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at the base of this one. We can see a small mark there. It says Plichter, London, mm. England. They were retailed by Thomas Good & Co. Yeah. in London. Well, they've gone up in value since the £60. This pig now, if uh, he came up at auction, is going to fetch about £2,500 wow. in spite of the damage. Yeah. And the cat, which is an unusual object really, cats are less common than pigs, but not quite as collectible. It's going to be 1200 with that bit of damage on the right. ear. Yeah. So, two good things and uh, a good investment for £60. Yes. Fine, thank you very much. Thank indeed. you for bringing thank them. You. Thank you. An American what? Apple peeler. Apple peeler? Oh, it's So how does this work then? It's dead from the Second War. Dating from the Second World War. Yeah, an American. I haven't got an apple with you, have you? Yeah. Uh, well, that's convenient, isn't it? I used to like putting pennies on them and posting on them because then you could either try and get them out or you could undo the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here he is. Here's Mr. Punch. Yeah. Uh, you put the coin on Judy's frying pan and then that's the way to do it. It gets her beaten around the head and um, it sounds like there's some money in there. There, should, there may even be some old pennies. I don't really know. The bottom here is printed with the details of uh, where it came from in the States. And I think that it was probably uh, patented by a company called Stevens, um, who were responsible for some of the more interesting mechanical banks in the latter part of the 19th century. Oh, well, well, it's worth certainly worth a pound. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> Somebody's generous. Uh, and if we have a look in the bottom here, you can actually see the mechanism primed and then working on the flick of the switch. What I like is the, the way that the money box fits into American rural society because they were made by the people who originally would have made plowshares and, and really heavy domestic and agricultural equipment. This is a bank in good condition, 
Uh, it's got a very nice painted background here, worth much more than the one pound odd that's inside. I would have said something in the region of perhaps five to eight hundred pounds. Really? Nice. That's, that's good. It's not bad. Mm. Oh my God! <laughs> what a fantastic! It's a nice up, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what a fantastic! Whoops! And a fantastic! Oh! <laughs> and, it, and it delivers. Okay, what, what, well, I might think. Have a bite. Mmm. <laughs> a magnificent machine. What's it called, this machine? Uh, bonanza. A bonanza. It would be called a bonanza, wouldn't it? Well, how extraordinary. I have never seen such a bizarre piece of domestic equipment in all my life. For me, even though I'm not Cornish, the high point of any journey to the West Country is crossing the Royal Albert Bridge. And here we have it in replica. I've always had a passion for Brunel. I've always had a passion for this bridge in particular. And to me, this is a magic moment. You know, here we have it. Where does it come from? I believe it came from um, a gentleman who was uh, an apprentice in the dockyard back in the 1850s. Right. Uh, I was always led to believe So it's a family that. piece? So it's been handed down to the family. And you've always had it in your house or in your um, family house? In my, in my time. Yes, yes, in your time. Yes. Now, this bridge was completed or opened in 1859. It was Brunel's last great design. And when he was dying, and the bridge was just opened in time, he was transported across, lying on a flat railway truck. And he died very soon after. It was a revolutionary bridge for all sorts of reasons. Emotionally, it was the first physical link between Cornwall and England, if you like, that made it possible to travel all the way to Cornwall by train. And so this bridge really represented the boundary with Cornwall. Once you'd crossed the Tamar, you were there. It's a wonderful structure because it's so high. You, you climb up above, above the houses and then down through Saltash to get across the river. And this was all because the Admiralty said the bridge had to be far above the mast height at high tide of any ship that went under it. He had to invent a new technology to do it, um, this tubed construction using iron had never been tried before. And with all his works, everybody said, it'll never work, it'll fall down, it'll collapse, the trains will fall into the river. And of course, he was right. And to me, he was a, a fantastic hero. A great builder of ships, the Great Britain, the Great Eastern, designer of mobile hospitals for the Crimean War, but above all, the engineer of the Great Western Railway. And this was one of the supreme achievements, I think, of a wonderful man. But of course, the question is, what do we do with this? It's got all these numbers, up to 52 mm -hmm. weeks of the year. What do you hang in all these slots? Do you know? Well, I always thought it was pipes. What sort of pipe? Uh, clay pipes. So long so church wardens' clay pipes. Yeah. Would fit there, but do you smoke a different pipe? Not you. Does one smoke a different pipe every week of the year? Well, I assume that clay pipes broke very quickly when they were smoked or... Or well, they, they do. They burn through. They burn and through. Perhaps they so need maybe more you, of them. But would you hang the whole year's supply out? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Is it a scoring system for a game? 52 cards? You know, there's all sorts of possibilities. Yeah. I think it remains a mystery. But that, to me, is not the important thing. That's a curiosity which we probably won't solve. Mm. But it's just such an exciting thing to see because the bridge is here. You, nothing mm. could be better in Plymouth than to have, for me, than to have this bridge. Um, it is a remarkable thing. Beautifully made and a highly desirable object. What do you do with it? It hangs on the wall in the house, and it will pass through my family, hopefully. Quite right. It was my mother's wish that it never left the West Country. And so it should um, And if, you know, any of us chose not to keep it, then it was to be given to Cornwall as I a gift. I think it's absolutely right. It should stay here. It's part of the history, because yes. I'm sure it's contemporary with the opening of the bridge. Yes. And therefore, I would see, in the right sort of environment, £3,000 asked for it. Just that. Ooh. I think so. Now, this is an unbelievable collection of Arab and Turkoman jewellery. Tell me, were you a favourite of the harem? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I lived and worked in the Middle East for nearly ten years. Yes. And whilst I was there, I decided this was well worth collecting because I've got a very great magpie instinct, you yes, know. Yes, clearly, it's fantastic. And I, I would have liked to have collected more, but uh, you couldn't always find the quality pieces. And tell me, which are the quality pieces? Which do you admire most? Well, the Yemeni... Yes. Anklet has got to be, An of course. My yes. goodness me, what an enormous thing. And how, do, how does it work? I suppose one unpins it here. You pull out the pin. And then 
open it up That's and, right. and it's they not would quite put as put little stones inside a, so that they would rattle as they walked. Yes. Oh, I see. That's marvellous. And, and draw attention to the, to the legs, presumably. Right. Marvellous. And, and here, there's some, for authenticity, there's even some sand falling out oh, of yes, there. Oh, yes, I'm sorry about the sand. A little bit of Yemeni sand right. coming out of, right. out of there. How wonderful. Yes. Now, what are your other favourite pieces? Well, my other favourite pieces are the two Turkmen mm -hmm. bracelets. Yes, I'll put they one go on. on like that. Now, they're fascinating from a technical point of view because the work on them is, is granulation and filigree. Yes. And um, that's achieved by the use of a a colloidal hard solder, which is rather complicated um, metallurgical technique, which allows beadwork and, and, and wires to be yes. soldered almost without any signs of solder. And it's a technique that's fantastically ancient and really has survived in ethnic jewellery and tribal jewellery, and, uh, and, and we don't see it in many other places today. It's very clever of you to, to have assembled such a wonderful collection. Well, they don't use valuable things, of course. I mm. think that is uh, coloured glass. Yes, I expect it is. At best, it could be a cornelian. Oh, cornelian. I think it is glass. Mm -hmm. You can actually see the, the structure of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. a, a cornelian would be something that was available to them. And it's wonderful ambers as well. Yes, yes. Not the sort of thing you wear to the disco. You know, well, I think actually <laughs> they'd be probably exactly what one would wear to the disco. <laughs> they're, they're what people want today, which is, not, which is interesting jewellery and not not conspicuously valuable jewellery. Some of the amber might be reconstituted, it might not be natural, but what I like about it is that there is it's evidence of, of, of great wear here, that mm. somebody has loved this necklace and worn it a lot. Worn so this is not souvenir material that you bought, this is no. the real thing, isn't real it? They, real really, McCoy. and that's very exciting. Tell me about this one, where, where, where was that worn? Well, that's a, a headdress piece. Show me how it wore. It's wonderful, is isn't it? it? Very, very oh, adoring, yeah. that one, isn't it? It's wonderful. The coins are... Uh, Turkish and Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yes, now tell me, why do you think the Austro-Hungarian coins found their way over there? I don't know, unless it's something to do with the fact that uh, their currency at that time, excuse me, mm -hmm. would have been the Maria Theresa Tala, yes. which was of course converted into a number of And they would have pieces. viewed it simply as bullion, I mean a coin that's, of that sort, because right. this is a coin from from Austria from about Austria. 1760, That's presumably. Right. She, as you know, was the mother of Marie Antoinette. Yes, of course, and I don't think for a minute that, um, Mar uh, that, that Maria Theresa would ever have thought she'd end up in an ethnic um, dependent and no, sure But um, I'm, and, and clearly they wouldn't have understood quite the significance of no. a coin like that. They were no. simply viewing it as bullion, exactly. weren't they? They're looking and at this it. is a show of wealth, isn't it, for a, for a, for a married woman, That's presumably, true. in the main. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think you were absolutely brilliant to have bought this when you did. <laughs> well, I do, because <laughs> Thank you very much. the world is changing so quickly, and in a way, we're becoming um, westernized. Mm. The world is becoming seemingly all western, and you've found wonderful things with certainly some age to them, a hundred years for a good proportion of them. And um, I think it's rather thrilling in a way. They're, they're ethnic objects, truly ethnic objects that you brought back um, to cherish and to, to look after. Well, these we do use as, mm -hmm. as napkins. Oh, as napkin rings. <laughs> well, that's, that's a brilliant <laughs> idea, isn't it? That seems to solve everything. Because <laughs> they're tiny, tiny wrists. I wonder. They are tiny wrists, but of course the, the women, the adults, would have been quite small. Yes, of course. Yeah, now, I well, just want to give some idea of what they cost. Tell us a bit about how, how much each one was. Well, I paid in local money about a hundred pounds each for those mm. two. Well, that sounds very good to me. Doesn't and it? for that one. For the hundred pounds for the That's mammoth right. anchors. That's right. And for these two. Yes. yes. Heaven knows what they're, they're worth. Today. I, I think I'm going to confess and say I simply don't know. Yes. I think they're going to be growing in value enormously as, as the, the supply of them shrinks. And of course, the Middle East is a fantastically wealthy area, which is going to take a renewed interest in what yes, came before. Quite, quite. Well, I think it's an absolutely stunning collection, and it's a nest egg for the future. Thanks very much for giving us a chance to look at them. Thank you very much. Well, now for our regular weekly look at the archive to mark this, our 21st anniversary year. And I'm joined this week by Christopher Payne. First, Christopher, a look at some of your finds. They're made of oak, which is yes. typical of yes. these high-quality Victorian Gothic mm -hmm. reform pieces, loosely termed arts and crafts. But there's a lot of detail on them. I think the nicest thing, looking at the side, is, of course, there's one missing here, yes. the four dots, yes. which are part of the construction. Yes. You have a maker's day book, journal, with a list of his, some of his clients in it. Yes. 
and just go to page one. The Duke of the Clue, made for Dalkley. A wardrobe with wings in the French style, finished in white and gold, and varnished for the Queen's room. And there we have the drawing of the piece of furniture with, incredibly, the date, 1843. Well, when I bought them, I was told that these lions were cast, he thought, in about 1820 at the Rassau foundry in Ebervale, which is a, a valley very near us. It's very difficult to put one's finger on it, especially yeah. without a maker's name. But I would yeah. go for a little bit later than your 1820, possibly 1825, 1850. They are copies, right? Made probably by Donald Ross, almost certainly. Um, in, I would say, about the same time, the 1880s. I mean, nobody knows much more about him, really. Um, but they're made in England, in this French So they're style. not French at all? No, they're English. Right. The wood's used exactly the same as the original 18th century one. You've got satin wood here, then outlining, you've got ebony and boxwood stringing, with this thin piece of tulip wood going all the way through here in the, in the diamond. But look at the condition. They need nothing to do to doing to them. They're completely original, untouched. They need perhaps a little bit of polish up. I would go home, ring your insurance company, and ask to insure them for £10,000 the pair. Good thing. You're joking. No, I'm not. <laughs> Fred Leighton. Fred Leighton. The peer of the realm. Frederick Lord Leighton. Mm -hmm. One of the most important and possibly influential members of the English New School of Sculpture, working in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, this is m one of the most marvellous of the New School of Bronzes. This as you can see in the front, called the sluggard. Yes. Waking up in the morning like that, stretching, sort of bleary eyes. Mm -hmm. And he developed this as a life-size bronze, which was first exhibited in the Royal Academy in 1886. The quality of the patination, the even colour, it's typical of a really good new sort of sculpture. So, it's an important thing, and reasonably rare, although, as I say, quite a few must have been made. Have a stab at the value if you don't know about it. I have no idea at all. If you saw this in a shop today, let's say a West End mm -hmm. art dealer shop, mm -hmm. I think you'd expect to pay £10,000 for it. Oh, God. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable, but true. But you know, of all the wonderful things you've seen on the roadshow, Christopher, the two that I most remember are those cabinet makers' day books. They're wonderful. I'm still researching them, Hugh. Are you? I haven't found out who the maker of the furniture was. We know his customers, how much he charged, when he made it. We know what they look like. I haven't tracked him down yet. And it's the sort of things you wouldn't see in any other circumstances. I mean, they're not really the sort of things that would turn up in, in sales, are they? Very rarely, and certainly unidentified. It'd be hopeless. But, but useful for someone like you, because your approach towards furniture in particular is quite academic, isn't it? I mean, you, you, you love the research of no, It fascinates me. That is what I want to do. It's fascinating. You, putting the jigsaw together to arrive at where we are today, it's just it's wonderful. Very interesting. But is the scholarship, as it were, set in stone or, or subject to change? It does change. I mean, that pair of tables we've just seen, um, originally, the one was in the Victorian Albert Museum as 18th century, mm -hmm. and it was, a letter was discovered. And in fact, it was a 19th century copy made for the museum. And after that, I did my research about the 19th century copies. It always changes. Now, people associate you, of course, with furniture, because that in the main is what you do, but of course, there we saw you handle bronzes as well. Now, how did you come to acquire your knowledge of bronze? It was terrifying. I was thrown into it. I took over a department in a major auction house in 1976, where it, suddenly I was asked to do the furniture, but they also did sculpture, and nobody told me that, so I arrived there and had to learn very fast. How did you learn? I wrote a book about it. <laughs> really? Yes. You mean in the research for the book provided the background for the knowledge? For the cataloguing, yes. Yeah. Visiting a uh, Chinese antique shop. Yes. I walked in, and hidden on the bottom, nicely covered up, yes. this blue vase. Yes. Looked at all the gloss of the shop. What I'm really interested in is that down there. Yes. What is it? And then we got talking and he explained all about what it was. And I said, well, why does it keep coming up? He said, because everybody keeps coming in and wants to knock it up. So he sold it to you? And he told you it was what? Right, now I have to read off my You have to read it up. Okay, tell me what it says. This is very exciting. It's a very, very cleverly made fake. How is that? The nose stitching and this... I think it's something like eight or six seams all the way around the nose. It actually makes it much more pointed. It looks more like a mouth. You've got very rounded ears. 
Um, sometimes you might find a stife button in the ear, which is, again, makes you think, oh my God, I got a stife for 150 pounds, aren't I lucky? But you have not. And time after time, you'll find it's been worn in all the wrong places. Look for wear and tear on this so-called fur. Look for the pads. They must be made of felt, not of um, suede. And I suppose I would have been taken in had I not been doing it for years and years and years. It's worth, what, a, what is a fake worth? You know, what is a fake worth? It's certainly not worth 150. And it, if it had been a Steig, this color, 1908, it would have been worth 4,000 pounds. I want to know the date. 16th century. Yeah, trends me. It's 16th century. Okay. okay. Now, well, this design is a very, very exciting design because it's a well-known early Chinese, early Ming Dynasty design. Um, but in the early Ming Dynasty, they had trouble with this cobalt. It broke through the glaze. Uh, it reacted rather like blotting paper when they tried to put it onto. Well, that's iron. That's actually iron breaking through. That's not cobalt. Um, and you're not getting. Yes, this is iron. The, these brown specks are iron, but the, the blue I'm talking about, the cobalt here, um, this was applied in the early Ming Dynasty, it was applied rather like a pointillist technique, bang, 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 like this. The result is it breaks through, it erupts through the glaze, um, but you haven't got any eruptions here whatsoever. And the style is called heaping and piling. They had to do this to try to saturate the blue. The other thing that strikes me about this is it's very, very, very heavy. And, and turning it upside down, it doesn't have a flat base, which is what I'd want in an early Ming piece. It has a recessed base. Um, it's basically copying Ming. So the great question is, how much later than the Ming Dynasty is it? Is it a late Ming copy, as, as your trader told you, or is it something far, far more recent? I have to say, I don't know for certain, but I can tell you that I personally think it is a good deal younger uh, than your trader suggested. And can I also just... He's a little rogue, is he? He could be a little rogue, and he's tried the ancient jar under the counter trick, making an object more desirable than perhaps it ought to be by putting it somewhere that you can't find it or you have to sniff it out. And it certainly ain't uh, the period that this whole very classic early Ming design um, is, tr is purporting to be. So what did you pay for it? A hundred pounds. If he had thought it was the date that he's written on this piece of paper, he would have charged you a great deal more. <laughs> if it was the design of the period of this classic early Ming piece, this would be a, a half a million pound pot. Uh, easily. Except I'm glad it's not that, because I feel very nervous. So at £100, it's a great bargain, and it's got a great story. Yes. Well, you remember at the beginning of the programme, I told you the story of how Napoleon Bonaparte came to be in Plymouth in 1815, after the Battle of Waterloo. Well, look at what's just come in. This green Morocco leather case is actually French imperial green, and inside this superb miniature of the former emperor, he's actually still wearing the green uniform that he had at that time. And this is exactly the sort of thing that he might have presented to someone in gratitude for a service received. It is therefore not beyond the realms of possibility that this could have been presented to someone here in Plymouth, perhaps even Captain Maitland of HMS Bellerophon, before Napoleon set out on his final journey to St. Helena. A romantic story, but it could just be true. Well, I bought a house in 1948. 1905 it was built by the Duke of Bedford's kingsman oh, mm -hmm. and evidently he collected quite a lot of pieces of rare furniture. When I went to get the keys at the house there was Christie's and Sotheby's vans in the drive collecting all the best bits as I thought but the lady who I had bought it from said would you like to select one of the pieces I've chosen uh, to go back to South Africa with me so that I know it will remain in the house? And I'm so thrilled to think now there is a young woman, as I was then, with three children so that the pitter-patter and the laughter of the children will be able to remain good with the staircase in the house. What a lovely story, so, and what a generous idea to yes. leave it to, to, to... And I chose this piece. 
Right. Mind you, I think the glass is stretched a bit. That doesn't matter but at I all. But I suppose old age, like so me. So you mentioned <laughs> the, the Duke of Bedford. I mean, what have we got? Well, we've got an English lock. Yes. Um, which doesn't surprise me. Sometimes these can be French with change locks, but that looks like it's been there all its life. So it is a Chubbs lock, who were important makers in the mid-19th century. And that fits in with this. I said that it might be designed by a Frenchman. It fits in with the sort of thing that I'd expect to perhaps be designed by a Frenchman who came over to work in London at the time of the Great Exhibition, 1851. Mm -hmm. There was a Paris Exhibition in 1855. It fits in exactly with that mid-19th century fairly early Victorian period. It is English, though. I think it's English, but it's very quirky. I've never seen a design like this ever. I mean, the wood is, well, again, a mixture of woods. I mean, well, rosewood, which was used in France, but to a larger extent in England. Uh -huh. But this is more of a giveaway to me, apart from the English locks, is this walnut here, the lovely black graining. It may well be American walnut, but was almost exclusively used in this country in the mid-19th century. But we can just look at the drawer and see what that tells us. Well, again, secure lock, so it's an English lock again. And, oh, it hasn't been out for a while, has it? But there we go, that's it. Once already. Well, first thing, that little beading in there yeah. is 100% England. That little quarter moulding. Only the English did that sort of moulding. Mm. But they... Mm. Have you ever had a sniff? It's <laughs> cedar. Is it? Wonderful, wonderful smell. So that's cedar of Lebanon. This is very expensively made. Very expensively made. Whoever made this, whatever company furniture makers made it, used the best materials they possibly could. It's a, a beautifully made drawer. It really is Dug nice. Dovetailing. Dovetailing, yes. yes. There, handmade, hand inscribed. And the rear dovetails, which people don't often bother to look at, the way the dovetail on the side goes over right through to the back at the top here, is indicative of a 19th century manufacturer. The 18th century did it the other way normally. So it's, but there's no doubt about the date. It's 1850, 1860, an English made. I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful quality and this very innovative design, which I love. I don't, uh, it's a dangerous thing to say, I don't think I'll ever see anything like it. Really? I'm sure it was a one off piece made for either the Bedford family or, as you say, one of their near kinsmen, because whoever had this made for him could afford to buy the best. It's very, very top quality, very nice indeed. It's lovely to display your family's history, isn't it? And this that? is all the family, some of the family well, history? Well, I've got loads of it. Loads yes. of medals, well yes. done. <laughs> <laughs> so you've had this, you've given this in 1948. Yes. Which, um, I won't tell anyone else, it was the year I was born, so oh. quite a long, oh. few years ago. <laughs> so, 1948. Well, it's very difficult to value it. I think the only way you'd really find out what this is worth is by putting it up for auction and selling it. Because I think you probably put an estimate of around four to six thousand pounds on it at auction. But I have a sneaking suspicion with anything like a little bit of luck and a good market and a bit of the wind behind you, I can see it making seven or eight thousand pounds or more easily. I love this. So will you insure it for me for a minimum of ten thousand pounds? Ten thousand? Think of the money paid out in insurance. Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Anyway, it's very nice of you to have valued it for me. Thank you for bringing it in to me. Yeah. Thank you. When my parents in law died, my husband and I were clearing out the house, and up in the loft we found a box of broken china, smashed to smithereens. That man was in about 12 pieces, and the woman was in about five pieces. We very nearly threw them away. I settled down one day at the kitchen table and thought I'm going to do something about them. So with a tube of glue, I stuck them together again. And uh, I've always wondered what the marks underneath were. So you don't know where they come from? Nope. Well, the marks nope. underneath are um, extremely helpful because here you have a lion rampant mm -hmm. and here you have um, a PAH monogram. That is the monogram of Paul Anton Hannon. And this is the mark that he used, first of all, at Strasbourg and then at Frankenthal. Now, and that was because of a bit of politics. He set up a very successful factory at Strasbourg and was doing very nicely, made faience, and then he started making porcelain. And then Madame de Pompadour got at Louis XV and made him give a monopoly of all porcelain manufacturing in France to 
first sent, and so, and so, poor old Mr. Hannon had to move. Yeah. And so he got on the telephone to the Elector Palatine, Carl Theodore, and moved his factory across the Rhine to Frankenthal and got his patrons. And so these are 1755, just as when he literally moved his factory across the Rhine and ma made these delightful figures. And he had a very good modeler who was called Johann Wilhelm Lanz, who actually modeled these uh, uh, two characters um, representing winter. Very nice courtly figures, beautifully modeled. I mean, I think it's, there's little details here on him are delightful, the painting's very good quality, and then you get these lovely, here, beautiful yeah. rococo yeah. scroll faces. Yeah. Typical rococo faces. Right, they're damaged. But still, when I tell you that, I don't remember ever seeing these figures in the market at all. And um, um, Frankenthal figures are rare, and people are very keen on them. Obviously, had they been perfect, they would be four, five, or more thousand pounds. I think still today they're worth well over a thousand pounds, maybe up to two. Gosh. Well, I bought it because it uh, was an exact replica of my daughter uh, when she was about 14 years old. And I completely fell in love with it. And uh, I thought, well, one day I'm going to give it to her. And this was about 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. But you're still hanging on to it. Still hanging <laughs> on to it. <laughs> well, it is really beautiful and it's by... Frederick Lord Leighton, as you well know, and who was the finest of the neoclassical artists, I mean, the great child genius. And uh, what, uh, what she actually called, what's the title of the Nicandra. name? Nicandra. 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 Which does... I don't, a Spanish I, look. If you, if you think she's Spanish, I think she's Italian. Oh, Italian, yes. Could well, be. it would make more sense if she was Italian, because that's where Leighton trained, in Rome, yeah. with, in Feuerbach's studio. So, and, and I think, don't you think this costume feels yes. more... Yes. The thing about Leighton to me is that you know the French go on about how Angra's flesh is the most beautiful flesh of the painting. And I think that Leighton's flesh is just as good, especially here when he's doing southern girls. When he's doing the northern girls, they're very sort of ivory white, almost porcelain white. But here, the, the translucency of this olivey flesh is really beautiful. And then the other thing I think is really beautiful about this is her swan-like neck. And, the, and, and, and that's what you want from Lord Leighton, something exquisite. I mean, although Leighton is a neoclassical artist, and in a way, when you think of pre-Raphaelites, these beautiful women, even though they're neoclassical rather than pre-Raphaelite, all come into the same collector's basket. And the pre-Raphaelite star has risen in the so little material, and, and the same with Leighton. So, what did you pay for it? I paid £1,500 for it. My feeling is that today it's worth somewhat over £100,000. Really? Well, that's a very nice surprise. I hope I, I, I'm sure I'll be keeping it for another 30 years. I hope so. Well, no, you're <laughs> supposed to be giving it to your daughter. Well, that's I your will play, but that's, that's finally <laughs> the final move. The, the last gasp. The final gasp, yes. <laughs> Precisely. Well, we've had a very interesting day here in Plymouth, a wide variety of things, so our thanks to everyone here. Before we go, a reminder about Comic Relief and this special fact sheet that we've produced in association with them, 21 rare China marks prepared by Henry Sandon. If you'd like to get a copy of this before Comic Relief next Friday, do please send a donation to the address I'm about to give you, a donation of £1.50 or more if you can possibly afford it. Here's the address. Comic Relief Antiques Roadshow Fact Sheet, Department 2222, Snowdon Drive, Winter Hill, Milton Keynes, MK6 1HQ. With your checks, please, made payable to Comic Relief Antiques Roadshow. So, until next week, when once again we'll take the show on the road from all of us here in Plymouth, goodbye. <laughs>and the Antiques Roadshow will be back next week at 6.45. Coming up next this evening on BBC One, the elusive and cunning world of the wild wolf in a wildlife special.
And roadshow expert Peter Nahoon takes a closer look at Lord Leighton's painting. Based on Velope 2 Down Syndrome, P.O. Box 4000, Manchester M63LL. What do you associate with the word disability? How about fashion, fetish, sex, bikers and ballroom dancing? It's the show that turns disability upside down and gives it a good spanking. Freak Out, Friday, 10 past 11 on 4. Last Friday, ITN broadcast its final News at 10 bulletin. Tonight, Channel 4 looks back at over 30 years of the bongs. And finally, is next. Excuse me, is now a good time to talk, Professor? So it's you who want to know about those people who came here. They were very interested in neurosurgery. Didn't that seem strange at the time? No, it didn't. This is a teaching hospital. And they only want you to understand why I use lasers. And why do you use lasers? It's no secret. The lasers I use are incredibly accurate to one thousandth of a millimeter. They went away very... They went away very excited. They had this crazy idea about using a laser for precision welding on all the major... Go home to get some sleep. <laughs> but being married has given Mark a new authority. This is the coup, right? I'm not being funny, this is the truth. I ain't mucking about. When you're single, you can do what you like. You're married, you do what you self. I'm in charge now, aren't I? Next week, Melanie and Darren have just half an hour to get ready for their wedding. Rush in and rush out? <laughs> John plans a surprise wedding for Susan. It's amazing how we've kept it such a huge, huge secret. And Margaret does what she loves most, selling a kilt to a tourist. It's a big, oh, that's made my day. <laughs> Join Jerry Halliwell, Dervla Kerwin and Nick Hancock all up for the comic relief action adventure next on BBC One. The marriage, you know, not mother and son. Mrs. Merton and Malcolm, tomorrow at eight thirty on BBC One. Bringing home messages of hope now on BBC One, celebrities galore raising awareness for comic relief's great big, excellent African adventure. The story so far. Our message tape is travelling the length of Africa, carried by a series of rather hot comic relief message gatherers. Last week we met the Maasai Hello. and crossed Tanzania with Julian Clary. Julian. Went to visit the widows of Rwanda with Paul Bradley. Reached the source of the Nile with Stephen Fry, who handed over to Jerry Halliwell, and she's about to get the shock of her life. I've got to go down and they wish me luck. I hope I survive. Yes, I'm going to pull you in back in the boat. I'm going to show you how to be rescued. Stay there. All right, it's really easy. I never thought I'd start in the water, and this is only a safety drill. OK, what are you going to do, guys? You're going to keep your hands attached. OK, I'm going to hold you by the life jacket like this, and I'm going to go <laughs> one, two, three, and just yank you in. OK, you don't want to get dragged over that. That's really going to hurt. Okay, so ready? One, two, three! Oh, excuse me. 
Okay, your life jacket's too loose. I don't have no dignity left by the end of this thing. Right. Comic relief dared me to do this. It sounded like fun in London. Jump back in, jump back in. Jump in. Okay. The idea is to get the tape to Ethiopia by taking it up the Nile. As soon as we'd learned to paddle with Mike, our Kiwi boatman, we were on our first rapid. This one's called Easy Rider, but still someone falls out, not me, thank God. There's a support boat with us. The rafting company claim they've never lost a customer, but there's always a first time. All right, guys, next rabbit's called Total Gunga. Um, to us, Gunga means insanity. It's class five, okay? So class five basically means um, there's a really good chance we're all gonna go swimming here, all right? Oh my God. We've got to paddle really, really hard, and then we're gonna go forward, forward. We're gonna come up over to a very big rise of water, like a mound. Um, one of several things can happen here, usually one of three. We can hit it, pop straight through. Okay, rare. We can hit it, climb up it, and then get sucked back down into it. So literally get sucked back into, into the hole. Um, if that happens, it's gonna be, we're going to be surfing. Surfing's about the most spectacular thing that happens in the whitewater rafting world, and this is probably one of the most spectacular places in the world to do it. then suddenly I'm not in the boat anymore. Thank God the rescue kayak fishes me out. All I could see was brown water and I panicked and nearly drowned. Um, here comes Godfrey coming to rescue me and I nearly drowned him. And then another guy in his canoe tried to save me and I just completely panicked. And I take it all back very, very scary. So, I don't want to do it again. I'm shitting myself. I thought I was going to die. There's four girls back in England that paid for us to kill you. Oh, four girls back in England paid for us to kill you. There's a conspiracy! <laughs> okay, forward paddle team, forward. Rapids seem to alternate, a hard one then an easy one. I must say it's a damn silly way to get a tape to Downing Street. All right, guys, so um, this is the next one we have coming up. We've got to try and imagine this one. What you've got is this whole river today is flowing in about 3,000 cubic metres of water per second. And what I want you to try and imagine is what 2,000 cubic metres of water per second must look like when it's forced into a 25 metre gap and it drops six metres. Okay, it's a class five rapid, it's Big Brother and it's right there. It's a beauty. Oh no, am I gonna fall out? Okay. Oh, I yeah. really am no. scared of How did you lose that tooth? Ah. The time I was planning this job. You lost your tooth in water rafting. Yeah. For God's sake! <laughs> there will be no get downs here. I know it's class five, but you will not be getting on the floor. You will be paddling. But when you get over there, you're all no, sadomasochist. You are. No, it's not going to be horrible like before. 
Well, a little bit horrible. I don't want to do this. how the scariest day of my life ends. It feels like I've spent more time underwater than on it. So you might think I've conquered the Nile, the Seven Rapids. I just have to say, it's an experience that I will never, ever forget. I'm glad I've done it, but it's something that I think it's deeply affected me. So I actually, when I was on the boat, I really wanted to cry my eyes out. I was so frightened. I wanted to say, I knew what my mum, but... You know, I felt a bit embarrassed because there's all blokes on there. So, but anyway, I've done it and I'm glad I have. You know, people have done worse things than that. So, but anyway, it's part of Africa and Africa is beautiful. Dangerous, but beautiful. It's pretty obvious the message tape isn't going to get to the Mediterranean by going down the River Nile. So I've got to find another way. Then I have a brainwave. The only way to travel, cycle, taxi. The tapes in here has got to get to Ethiopia, but I can't go, so I'm going to post it. So let's hope it gets there. It's a real test for the post office. Now it's Dervla Kerwin's turn, and I wish her luck. <laughs> Addis Ababa lies at 8,000 feet. It's one of the highest capitals in the world. So my very first day in Africa is 